Hi, Dr. Munyan. Yeah. I... Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on is COVID-19 over or is it still lurking in the shadows and African response to the pandemic? We, please be patient with us. We're awaiting a few more candidates to join us. We've got our facilitator on the line as well. And if you could give us about five minutes before we kickstart proceedings. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our, our discussion on is COVID-19 over or is it still lurking in the shadows An African response to the pandemic? Welcome to our facilitator, Dr. S uh, Professor Jerome Singh, who will take over proceedings from here. Cheers. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. 
for joining us this morning. So I've got an enviable task of actually getting through quite a lot this morning with uh, very important guests and also trying to get through quite important uh, discussion as well. So what I'm going to do without further ado is to maybe just give you a quick brief overview and introduction to what we're hoping to achieve today and maybe just an overview of the pandemic as well. So, um, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has been, you know, something that we've had since the end of 2019, as I'm sure many of you know, we've had, um, we've actually had many people uh, in, in South Africa in particular affected by it. But just in terms of giving you a quick global overview, I thought it would be just important just to remind where things actually are at this point in time and how things started off. So as I'm sure all of you know, but just for our purposes, I'm just going to review it very quickly. But, uh, you know, a coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19, as we now call it, is caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome uh, so, uh, coronavirus 2. And in the WHO, we know it more uh, popularly as SARS-CoV-2. But this was a novel virus that was first identified from an outbreak in China at the end of 2019. Some reports say in November, but by December, of course, this was reported to the WHO. And by the next January, by the 30th of January 2020, the WHO had declared this a public health emergency of international concern. And by the 11th of March 2020, it was declared a pandemic, a global pandemic. Now, as of the 1st of July 2020, the pandemic has caused almost 550 million cases worldwide. The official number is 547 million. But of course, as we know, these are just official figures and these are only reported figures by governments. The figures are probably much more than that. Uh, we've got about, at this point in time, just over 6.3 million confirmed deaths. But as I said, these are just known confirmed deaths. Now, in terms of where South Africa is, We've recorded almost 4 million confirmed cases so far. However, the true number of people who have been infected with COVID-19 likely vastly exceeds the official statistics as all our people are getting tested. And of course, some deaths are not being accurately uh, captured as well. But more importantly, while official records show that South Africa has recorded almost 102,000 COVID fatalities to date, research conducted by the MRC, they do of ongoing assessments and surveillance. They've actually looked at mortality statistics and excess deaths. And they basically have noted that South Africa has recorded about almost 322,500 excess deaths for the period from the, just the 3rd of May, 2020 to the 25th of June, 2022. Now this is well more than three times the official statistics. And in terms of the provinces that lead that death toll, it's KZN, Gauteng and the Eastern Cape, they've recorded the highest numbers of excess deaths over that period. Now, relatively recently, of course, we've got a government making a series of announcements relatively recently at the end of June. And as I'm sure many of you know, the government has announced the end of mask mandates, proof of COVID-19 vaccinations to enter certain venues, and of course, an end to crowd limits as well. Uh, moreover, Travel restrictions and bans have been a major feature of the COVID-19 pandemic in South Africa and abroad. However, like some other governments, the South African government has also recently announced that COVID-19 vaccination is no longer a prerequisite requirement to enter South Africa. So, of course, these are just some of the issues uh, that you know we're going to be talking about today. And there's, of course, a very, very good and esteemed panel that will be joining us. In what I'm going to quickly just do is just give you an overview of our panelists and what we're going to do then is of course get into the discussion and into some of the points that I've just been speaking about. So um, in no particular order I'll just start off by introducing the panelists which I'm sure some of you would have maybe looked at already. Their biographies are available but just so that we are going over the panels, uh, the panelists here together. First off, we've got Professor Samantha Portkita. She's an infectious disease expert at uh, the Academias, uh, sorry, the Universitas Academia, Academic Hospital, and she's an affiliated lecturer at the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of Free State. 
Um, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, her main focus was on complicated HIV and TB drug resistance, as well as hospital-acquired infections. Since the emergence of COVID-19, she's been managing the COVID-19 clinical response at Universitas, and she'll be providing us, amongst other insights as well, a clinical assessment of the pandemic, and she'll uh, be probably offering us a local view with national undertones and uh, perhaps probably also outlining for us the way forward. And as we know, we've got a new monkeypox outbreak in South Africa. We've got a couple of cases so far, and we'll come back to that later. Uh, the next panelist that we have is Dr. Santheran Pele, who's a specialist psychiatrist in private practice for the last 20 years in Amshanga. He has a special interest in genomics since 1994, and is currently registered for his PhD in genomics. He's been part of the UPPS research group since 2002, and is currently the chairman of the UPPS Green Biotechnology Company. He's the holder of multiple patents, with the latest being in microbial scrubber for biofuel production. And Dr. Pillay will talk to us on many issues, but he'll probably be also looking at mitigating the pandemic from a South African and African perspective in light of what other nations have done. And he'll probably also be sharing with us the psychological impact of COVID-19 on people. And I think mental health has been one of the gaps in COVID-19. We are always looking at the medical aspects, but of course the psychological aspects has been quite big as well. And I think he'll probably give us insight on that as well. Uh, another panelist that we'll be having is Dr. Subesh Nimunian, who's a senior lecturer in geography and environmental sciences at the University of Kozuna Natal. She has a PhD in renewable energy and development, and her research looks at the human environmental nexus to better understand sustainability and vulnerability from both natural and social perspectives. And one of the key issues underpinning her research is the use of transdisciplinary approaches and blended methodologies to problem solving. And of course, this is what, why we have a multidisciplinary panel as well. And she's also an expert reviewer for the IPCC and several national and local government bodies. So this is quite an important aspect to consider as well. As we know, when we're looking at something like major pandemics, we do know now, and scientists are increasingly confirming that we're likely to see a spread of certain diseases from some regions to the other, but also importantly, because of changing climates, we may find that in fact, new emerging uh, diseases are now coming to the fore as the range and geographic spread uh, changes with climate change. So she'll be able to give us maybe some sort of input on that. And in particular, she'll probably unpack the impact on tourism uh, and focusing specifically on what it meant, what COVID-19 meant for the pandemic the tourism sector and especially the informal sector. And the last panelist that we have is Ogechi Eke Anyangu, who's the regional coordinator for Sub-Saharan Africa and the African Science Focus podcast team at SciDevNet. And she'll be explaining the importance of media and telling the story of the largest pandemic which is shaping the world. And I think probably, you know, this is quite an important element to consider I think the media has been quite crucial in getting messages across and also, of course, trying in some cases to address some of the issues that come up. And we know that with the COVID-19 pandemic from very early on, there was a great deal of, of misinformation. There's a great deal of disinformation. And of course, the media has been quite at the forefront of trying to expose this. And of course, in some cases, inadvertently maybe even covering these issues. And I think one of the important issues that she'll be looking at is the synergy between journalists and scientists in informing the public. So this is quite an important element as well in terms of um, what we'll be looking at. And she's an award-winning uh, Nigerian independent journalist and former contributing editor at The Cable. And she's pioneered many, many different issues over the period of time in Nigeria and beyond. And she's a passionate child and women's rights advocate and has worked as a consultant with MIND, which is a non-governmental organization that focuses on urban poor women. So amongst the issues she'll be looking at is why is this relationship between media and the science important to ensure the message gets the, that the public gets the right message on a very, very rapidly evolving pandemic. So 
Uh, we've got also with us as well, besides all the, the panelists, of course, we've got a huge media list as well. And uh, I won't go through all of them, but I'm hoping that they'll be quite engaged in the session. We'll be asking some questions as well. So I've just, as I said, given you a very brief overview and we don't have a hard and fast uh, format for this particular session. But what we'll be doing is we'll be actually looking at um, a range of different issues. As I said, I'll be looking at um, you know, some of the issues that I've raised already. And there is, of course, a, a webinar that uh, this particular webinar is going to be, of course, recorded. But you know, I think probably the three aspects that we'll be looking at is you know, the clinical aspects of COVID-19 and what it means, how it affects citizens, how is it transmitted, and of course, unpacking the risk management aspects of the pandemic. So how do we mitigate cross-border transmission according to national and global guidelines as well? Uh, and as I pointed out, we've got a speaker looking at communications and awareness, how is the pandemic affected the psychological being of the nation, and how from a human perspective and from a societal perspective. So I've raised some of the issues that have come up in the context of the, you know, in the context of some of the uh, issues that have been, you know, coming up since the end of 2019 and beginning of 2020. So the Africa had its first case in March. And I think probably what would be very good is to maybe just get a few opening thoughts from each of the panelists. And I've introduced them, but I think probably what would be maybe good is just to get some opening comments from each of them in terms of where they believe the pandemic is right now and where do they think we, sh we in fact may be heading. And I'll maybe ask a little bit more guided and more specific questions as we go, but I'll be very happy to maybe just get some overall uh, comments from each of the speakers. And so I think probably in maybe in the order that I've raised them, maybe we'll get uh, Dr. Samantha Pochita to give her opening remarks on where she thinks we are with the COVID-19 pandemic and where does she think we're going. And as I said, you know, our topic is, is COVID-19 over or is it still lurking in the shadows? So we'll just get her thoughts and then we'll go to the other speakers. So Dr. Pochita, if you have any opening remarks, it'll be great to hear them. Thank you so much, Prof, and for the for the introduction. Um, so yes, I think as I was considering the title of this webinar, sort of asking the question about whether the COVID pandemic is over, um, yeah, from a personal perspective, I was compelled to sort of sit down and think about where we've come from, um, where we currently are now with the pandemic and 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 where we where we headed. And I, I did this sort of not only as a doctor involved in treating the disease, but but also sort of as a person navigating life during a global pandemic, as we all are. So reflecting on where we've come from over the last two years, um, you know, as treating clinicians, we literally, we saw hundreds of patients die from COVID. Um, in Bloemfontein, where I practice in the Central Free State, we opened up a 100-bed um, field hospital ward and a 30-bed field ICU. And certainly during the peaks of the second and the third wave, we lost about a third of the patients that we admitted due to severe disease. Um, so, I, I, you know, the, it's, it's been really dark times. Um, looking at where we stand now, uh, I mean, since the beginning of 2022, uh, we've closed our field hospital sites. Um, we have vacated the, the hospital wards that we sort of repurposed into COVID wards. And our COVID ICU has actually been empty for the last five months. Um, and certainly uh, in a personal capacity as a clinician, I've not admitted a patient with a COVID pneumonia since January of this year. So I, I think really that it's this massive decrease in severe infections and hospitalizations, probably combined with the, the recent lowering of the public health regulations. Um, as everybody knows, sort of the, the recent dropping of the mask mandate, um, the abolition of restrictions on public gatherings and the relaxation of the, the sort of the travel and the border regulations that, that's kind of led many South Africans to the conclusion that COVID is over. Um, but, but unfortunately, I, and the, you know, I, I think this is premature and, and this is a personal opinion, COVID is not over. Um, I think that we can certainly say we're entering a different phase of the pandemic. We're definitely moving towards endemicity. Um, and, and as you mentioned, Prof, we know that there's a widespread immunity within our South African population. And whether this be vaccine induced or due to natural infection, if we look at our blood bank seroprevalence studies, 
I mean, we're looking at the, the fact that about 98% of South Africans actually have COVID antibodies. Um, but I think that immunity has been clearly shown to wane over time. Um, uh, there seems to be significant immune escape uh, with the emergence of each new variant. And we certainly saw this in, in the fifth wave that we've just exited in South Africa. Um, and I think, you know, with a with significant um, the sort of spark of infections and positivity rates in, in a patient in, in a patient population during the fifth wave that we already knew had significant immunity. So whilst this is disappointing, I think it's also been clear that um, that there's, there's definitely protection from severe disease, and this is still significant. And at least that you know we can say that for your average immune competent person. So I think even though we're not seeing large numbers of, of deaths and severe infections, and whilst our hospital admission rates for COVID are certainly not low, what we've seen is the significant disruptive effect on our society. So with each of these waves, our children are taken out of schools, um, we suffer decreased productivity, uh, there's, there's problems with service delivery, um, you know, all of these, these areas are affected as, as people are at home isolating, you know, with these, these mild to moderate infections. Um, and, I, and I think the other thing that we shouldn't forget is that many people are experiencing quite significant lingering symptoms, even long term effects. And we've been see seeing this really all over the world. So I think, unfortunately, we certainly can't say that COVID is over. Um, if I were to guess what the future holds, sort of looking, asking the question, where are we going? I think that the hope is that as repeated infection occurs and as vaccine protocols and booster doses are fine tuned, that we'll probably continue to see these waves of infection, but hopefully with increasingly milder less disease and with less and less disruptive disruption to our daily lives. So um, it's likely that there'll still be more variants um, with a degree of immune escape. Um, and there will certainly still be those immunosuppressed or vulnerable individuals that may experience severe disease. And for these, you know, we've got clinical tools such as vaccines and the antivirals and the advancements in the monoclonal antibodies. And, and these will all be important for these individuals. And I think we shouldn't overlook the significant advances made on these fronts. Um, yeah, I think we've learned so much during this pandemic, the, the rate at which scientific information has been generated, um, the need to be flexible and adjust our practices and our policies um, with the changing understanding of the science and of the disease process and pathogenesis and, and severity. Um, and then the importance of a sort of a coordinated and coherent public health response, I, I, I think, also needs to be needs to be um, uh, acknowledged. Um, and I think that these are all vital tools that we'll need to call on in the future. And, and, and I think also, as as Edwin alluded to, um, with the you know the, the global emergence of, of monkeypox, I think the fact is really driven home that COVID will likely not be our last pandemic. Um, so I guess in summary, as a clinician, I would say that we've certainly entered a new phase of the pandemic. And um, I'd like to think that although this probably isn't the end, um, I think for the first time, most of us, um, certainly as, as clinicians and, and, and really just as humans, can, can kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel and, and sort of picture what the end might look like. Um, uh, I look really forward to the further discussion. Um, uh, that's sort of really all in terms of an opening um, remarks. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. Dr. Pillay, do you have any opening thoughts for us on some of the areas that you think will be important to consider in terms of where we are and where you think we're going? Well, firstly, uh, thanks, Edwin, for the invitation and uh, thanks, Prof, for introducing me. Yes, I do have some remarks. I think um, if I just have to start off with the psychiatric aspects, COVID is far from over. It's like a person who's gone out for, for a bad night of binge drinking. We're now suffering from a post-COVID hangover. And uh, there's a lot of hangover symptoms uh, psychiatrically, not just the hangover from long COVID, which has a host of psychiatric presentations and symptoms, but the hangover from all the anxieties and traumas that COVID caused. You know, people have lost loved ones. And I don't think that there's any among us who can't say that we haven't lost somebody close to us. And people are dealing with the grief of, loss of loved ones. People are dealing with all the grief of mask anxiety. You know, some people just refuse to unmask. And then... We've got a whole generation of kids that spend two years behind the mask and you know important stages in their development, like recognizing facial expressions and interact uh, were lost for them. So they, they don't quite know how to interact. And then we have to, uh, to deal with the anxieties that the public goes through from a, almost a 
bordering on mass hysteria response to initially COVID to where their response lies now. And uh, from, a, from a psychiatric aspect, and look, I do also have a special interest in microbiology. I'm a rather strange psychiatrist that does microbiology. You know, COVID has changed. You know, uh, COVID has mutated and has become a mild mutation. And uh, it's not quite like the common flu in that it's not just once a year that it comes around. And it's most likely going to be something that's going to live on for many, many, many years, if not like the Spanish flu almost indefinitely. So we've just got to learn how to manage our anxieties and our perceptions of it and uh, develop a more pragmatic approach as that it, this is a disease that we'd have to learn to manage, whether we learn to manage it uh, with, with vaccines or social measures, it's something we've got to learn to, to manage. But you know, the psychiatric aspects, the anxieties that come with it all have to be managed. And uh, I'm glad we have media consultants there because I think in, in this day and age, media and social media play a, as much a critical role as in the medical management as, as the medical people do because people's perceptions of an illness are just important to their illness. You know, our perceptions affect our anxiety and our anxieties affect our immune response. So, you know, a, a happier, more confident person is gonna have a better immune response and able to fight over COVID better. But in COVID, it's like too good an immune response ain't that good either. So all I'm saying is that there are a host of psychiatric uh, uh, and psychological complications that have to be addressed and have to be managed. But the other complications that have to be managed is the associated increase in poverty that comes with COVID. You know, uh, we come from Africa. Africa is not the wealthiest country on earth. Africa is a nation that needs jobs, that needs food, that needs housing. And th the problem with COVID, you know, we don't give, with COVID coming, we're not giving attention to our people's other needs. And it's very important that we address the other needs that come with it. And we can't neglect our com community's needs because, uh, you know, the anxiety and the psychiatric aspects of lack of food or lack of housing and the other economic uh, complications that came with COVID are just as important as COVID itself. That's me in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Eke Nyawu, maybe you can share with us some of your uh, you know, your insights from the media and communications perspective. And I uh, would be very, very keen to hear your insights so far and where you think we are and where you think we're going. Um, so mostly post-COVID conversations is what we're having um, in the media space, uh, not post-COVID per se, but conversations on um, what the media can do to portray the the right picture, the exact picture of where we are in terms of management of COVID in the region, as well as um, just the impact or the effect of COVID. Um, and that's what we're really doing in the media at this point in time. We're fighting misinformation, disinformation as well, um, outright falsehood that manifests in this media space. Um, and then we're also looking at how, the, how COVID has really disrupted a normal living in the past two years in schools, kids are wearing masks um, and all of that. So we talk, some, oftentimes we hear of closure of schools and how this has impacted schooling system and led to learning losses. Um, we've also seen how, that we're also reporting on how COVID affected the health systems, um, as particularly in this part in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, as, we were already struggling with our health systems and with the emergence of COVID, that really put a stress, put some kind of stress on the health systems. And then we had more challenges um, with oftentimes, we, a lot of times we, there were cases where pregnant women weren't accessing health care they needed, all kinds of fallouts from um, the stress that the health system was facing because of, of the pandemic and uh, sort of an over-focus on treatment management of COVID. And so that's what we're really covering now. And then um, we're looking at the science as well, listening to the scientists and making sure that they have 
the larger voice, so sort of centering their voices in our reports so that we are not misinformed at any point in time, um, so that people aren't misinformed. And we're also, we, what we've been doing at CIDEF particularly is fact checking um, a lot of viral information on the media, in the media space where we see that um, because of the proliferation of social media messages, basically, where anyone can just come with a camera or any text that they like and put out falsehood, we're able to you know, trace those kinds of information and fact check, verify, talk to the scientists, put out the science out, put the science out there, and so that people get the clearest or the you know, accurate picture of what exactly is going on. Um, is COVID over? Of course not. Um, we're obviously dealing right now with the unimaginable disruption to normal life. Um, and, and the disruptions, I think, continue to delay the recovery of economies and just health systems in Africa. And um, so we're dealing with that in the media space as well, but also as humans in the region, that's also what we face um, daily, basically. Um, so to meet the continuing health system challenges is something that I, I guess that we need to continue to speak about. For instance, um, preparedness for next pandemic, there was this monkeypox right now, and it's uh, it's all of a sudden gaining global, um, well, the, there's a spotlight on it because it's it's not, it's, it, which is, it, monkeypox, for instance, has always existed in this part, well, in, in uh, West Africa, particularly countries like Congo, Nigeria, but all of a sudden it's gaining, uh, it's gaining ground in most parts of the world. It's now, uh, it's now a global concern and um, people are now talking about research. And um, this kind of conversation is important because if this, ex if this monkeypox existed all the while here and we weren't talking about and there was no spotlight placed on it in terms of even funding for research, understanding the disease. Um, is it time that Africa steps up in terms of preparedness of preparedness to manage pandemic of this sort and um, any other one that comes well because these kinds of things will always surface or show, show up. And so these are the conversations we're having in the media spaces as well and uh, making sure that we basically prioritize the voices of scientists who understand these things more. Um, thank you. Great, thank you so much for those opening remarks, uh, Dr. Minion. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, thanks for the invite. Um, you know, just to get to your question, is COVID over? I, perhaps this infectious event might be coming to its tail end, but pandemic sadly in a, in, a, in a global society where time and space is so compressed and we're so connected with each other, I think pandemics and exposure to infectious diseases are going to be more frequent, more frequent than we'd like to accept. So in that regard, you know, what this event has showed us is actually our preparedness and how well we can adapt, adopt, or face these challenges. Um, you know, we always refer to climate change as a threat multiplier, but COVID was actually, actually exposed some of those threats, our inabilities to handle, our inabilities to deal with certain consequences or certain events. For example, getting access to healthcare, getting access to basic essential services like water, which was so um, profoundly important in this context. So I think that more than addressing the issues, okay, fine, COVID is over, but I think we should really now start to un unpack some of those, the trailing devastation that this pandemic has sort of left behind. And in particular, when we look at COVID-19 and we look at the impacts and, and, and many of uh, the colleagues here have highlighted that it has long-term effects we are in year three and we don't even know what the long-term effects are. So I think this whole process has been a learning curve. It's also been a bit about exposing um, what needs to be done. And in order for us to be better prepared for the next infectious event, we need to have more 
probably access to health care or address those fundamental and grassroots issues. And I think that's some of the that's one of the elements that has sort of entered the conversation and has filtered into the debates across, throughout this event, but hasn't probably received enough, I would say, support. If we look at, uh, for example, China, China built a hospital in record time. We were struggling to get people the adequate medical care. So I think there's a number of things that we need to deal with uh, and address in order to say, right, we can close this chapter or we can close this COVID book and actually look forward. Um, it's done what it's done uh, an amazing thing by showing us exactly who the most vulnerable groups are. For example, um, in this whole pandemic, persons with disabilities, immunocompromised, the sick and the elderly, and especially the poor groups in our society were left behind, unfortunately. And I think that in order for us to progress, we need to start unpacking these debates. We need to start looking at them more critically. And we need to start looking at these events, even though they sort of medically related, we need to look at them through different lenses so that we are better prepared um, for, for the future. So um, I could go on uh, and talk about the socioeconomic aspects, for example. COVID had a profound impact on our socioeconomic status. Economically, COVID, for example, decimated our tourism industry. And many parts of South Africa, particularly the rural, particularly the low income uh, groups depend on these tourist streams for their daily livelihoods. So I don't think we fully sort of unpacked that type of uh, impact and that sort of uh, uh, um, lens to this whole uh, pandemic. Uh, I'm gonna stop there and hopefully uh, allow us to engage in further debate. Just Great. No, that's overview. that's very helpful. Thank you. So, you know, some of the issues that, of course, have been coming up at a global level, and of course, we're seeing this in South Africa as well, is that what is becoming very, very evident, and I think probably scientists much earlier on, and clinicians to a certain extent, vastly underestimated how quickly SARS-CoV-2 would actually evolve. In fact, it's not evolving over a period of years, it's, it's evolving over a period of months, and as we know, We've had multiple variants that have swept the world and been declared you know, variants of international concern. But I think probably what has been more startling relatively recently is that we're now seeing sub-variants as well. And you know, as we know with, the, with Omicron in particular, which you know, the first cases were seen, of course, in South Africa, is we now have sub-variants that have been identified, right? the BA.1, BA.2, and then of course, BA.2 had another little sub sub variant but more importantly what's been happening is that since South Africa reported its first cases of BA.4 and BA.5 we've in fact now been receiving more and more reports that these two sub variants are becoming dominant globally in fact in the US right now uh, just not too long ago in the last week BA.4 and BA.5 have become the dominant sub variants in the US and it's feeling a huge rise in cases in the US and of course, similarly in the UK as well. We had the Jubilee celebrations in the UK just uh, over a week ago, and we've had now a massive rise in cases. And this is being attributed to the two new subvariants. And of course, as we now are learning, each subvariant is in fact much more highly transmissible than the previous ones. And each version of the subvariants that are emerging are becoming better at evading both the natural immune response for those who have acquired uh, COVID naturally, but also those who have acquired immunity uh, through vaccination. And I think this has been one of the major concerns is that we still have, despite South Africa overall having relatively high levels of immunity, but mainly as a result of natural infections, what we do know is that we now, of course, even if you are vaccinated, we are now finding globally that you know vaccination is not preventing mild or moderate disease. And one troubling study that emerged, you know, just one so far, is showing that you know Omicron, the latest subvariants, may in fact, from being 
bronchitis type of infection in the last wave or so, uh, it may be again be developing into a bit of a lung disease. And you know, this is something of course really troubled us during the Delta wave of the pandemic. And I think the challenge is that, and we'll we will of course you know get the media insight on this as well. But I think one of the major challenges is that for many people, COVID is now in the review mirror and we have to move on with life and people are very eager to get back to the life that they had. But, you know, what is becoming more evident is that despite us being what we thought was being fully vaccinated with, for example, Johnson & Johnson with a single dose, which we've used in South Africa, or with Pfizer, which is the other vaccine that we've used in South Africa in our public vaccination programs, is that two doses is okay. What has become an emerging trend now is that we now do realize that we, of course, now need to have booster doses at ongoing intervals. And this has been something that has been quite troubling and quite challenging both for scientists to understand, but also, in fact, for clinicians to impress on patients the importance of getting booster doses. And, of course, we've got a very skeptical public and, more importantly, a very weary public. And so I think, you know, people have COVID fatigue, in a sense, not the, ment or not the physical, but mental and emotional. And so a lot of people are, in fact, you know, quite... Um, reluctant to get booster doses. And, you know, I thought we'd maybe just spend a little bit of time on this. And I'm just giving a very brief overview here because, you know, as I said, what's happening right now is that the scientific community has begun to realize that once you get vaccinated, we lose immunity relatively quickly. And in fact, with, especially with the, you know, with the sub-variants now of uh, Omicron, essentially we're losing our, our immunity uh, in, in our protection, we lose about 10% after just, we lose up to uh, a huge amount, but, you know, our protection wane to around only 10% of protection only after four to six months, which means that, you know, essentially studies are showing that vaccines prevented only 10% of the cases that would have occurred if all the individuals had been unvaccinated. But of course, we know what we do know is that being vaccinated results in less severe disease. But, you know, the, the challenge is getting people to understand this. And I think, you know, just to give everybody a quick overview, uh, in case you have not been following regulatory developments, but the U.S. Uh, Food and Drug Administration, and we've got in South Africa, the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority, that's basically our drugs regulator. And uh, the, you know, drug regulators around the world are the ones who, of course, have to authorize vaccines. Uh, COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics and diagnostics. But what the US FDA has decided to do now is in fact, they took a decision, an expert panel voted 19 to two, but the decision has been to actually update the, you know, the composition of the vaccine. And as we pointed out, you know, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has been with us globally anyway, since the start of 2020. And many countries around the world got their first cases by Feb, March. And in South Africa, it was early, Feb, uh, early March. But essentially, all vaccines around the world are based on the ancestral strain that emerged in China at the end of 2019. And since then, as we know, the ancestral strain has evolved quite a lot. And so there's been a big debate in scientific circles as to whether we should be giving people the same booster dose of the same composition when in fact the virus has evolved quite fast since then. So the US FDA has been the first major regulatory agency that's taken a vote now to update the composition of the vaccines. And this is something now that will have a global impact because you'll probably find European medicines agency will follow suit. And our, of course, other major drug regulatory authorities around the world may do something similar as well. And so what this means for us in South Africa and in other parts of the world is that if we have a you know, strain update for the Pfizer vaccine, as an example, you'll find that essentially it's going to be quite important to get people to get boosted for a, you know, for a booster dose that's been specifically targeting the Omicron variant. And of course, the scientific community is quite split on this issue. Some people believe that Omicron is already in the review mirror in a few months, we're gonna get another variant. And if we're doing a strain update, we are basically you know, basing it now on Omicron 1. And we've already moved to Omicron 2 in some countries. And of course, Omicron 
five and six BA dot four and five and uh, five and six are the dominant ones. So the big debate in scientific circles is which strain do we, or which subvariant do we update the composition with? And also more importantly, which is the longer term question, once you decide on which is the updated strain going to be based on, we've got to figure out how to get our populations and our clinic, you know, this is a major challenge for clinicians and we'll get Dr. Pocket's view on this, but the major challenge is how do we get people to say, okay, well, you've had two booster doses so far, um, you now need, because you've got your, your two doses. And of course, in some settings, of course, as we know, people have gotten their third and in some settings, their fourth booster dose. And, you know, it is very difficult to get people to even get the second booster dose. As we all know, in South Africa, people have gotten one dose of Pfizer, as an example. They've never gone back and gotten their second dose. And I think probably what I want to just speak about is that if we are at the point in the pandemic right now where we may need ongoing booster doses to prevent mild and moderate disease. And as I said, emerging evidence seems to suggest that while Omicron has been an upper respiratory tract infection, it may be evolving to, in fact, now, you know, this was a study from Japan, it may be, in fact, in evolving now to become a lower respiratory tract infection. And this has major implications in terms of making sure that we are boosted on a more regular basis to ensure that we prevent severe or development of severe disease. So, you know, in the UK, as an example, just using what's happening internationally right now, the UK hit its highest number of cases last week, you know, more than almost at any other time that it had. And it's resulting, of course, in a slow uptick now of hospitalization again. And in South Africa, we missed this to a certain extent, and there are various reasons and probably, you know, factors why this may have been the case. But the one major concern globally is that we might be reaching a point where the virus is mutating and not just getting more transmissible, which is, of course, what Omicron and all its subvariants are. But, of course, more importantly, it may be evolving now to become a more severe disease again. So I just thought I'd spend a little bit of time in terms of how do we overcome the challenge of encouraging people to get booster doses and uh, what each of your perspectives on that are and whether you think it's something that we should be focusing on or should not be focusing on. And we now, of course, at the point in the pandemic, I'm currently actually in North America, so apologies for being um, probably not as, as sharp as it normally would be. It's, a, it's just over four in the morning for me here or when we started. But essentially, I think you know, one of the challenges that we have in North America is that in a similar way, I've come from South Africa, where, of course, all of us are, were, were wearing masks when I left the country and arrived in Canada. And of course, people are not wearing masks. So it was a bit of a culture shock to me to go into a supermarket and find everybody else had no mask on and I was the only person with a mask on. So I think, you know, we're facing a similar transition point in South Africa now. And I wanted to get your thoughts on how do we encourage people or do we encourage people to get booster doses? And in the context of us now, simultaneously doing messaging and saying, we're not really required to wear masks anymore. And we can, in fact, pack a stadium full, 55,000 people in, and life has to carry on. So maybe we'll get Dr. Potkater to discuss uh, how she thinks we should be discussing with our patients booster doses and, in particular, completing vaccination schedules. Dr. Potkater. Thanks very much, Prof. Yes, it's... You know, it's 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 such a difficult um, topic because there there really are so many unknowns. I think that, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, you know, the 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 the, the, the great hope was pinned on a vaccine, um, uh, and uh, you know, with with the those you know the the, the early rollout of the, of the vaccine programs, it was met with very mixed responses from the the public. Um, but what I think the the overwhelming feeling was was this was sort of going to be a one hit wonder, and that was probably. I mean, that was probably quite naive. If if one looks at, at other viruses, um, I mean, if you take the hepatitis B um, virus, for example, we include hep B vaccination now as part of our, our childhood EPI. Um, we know that you need three doses. Um, uh, you know, they're not even considered a booster dose. It's sort of a, an extended primary vaccine schedule. So, you know, and and and, and looking at influenza virus, I mean, you know, there we we dealing with sort of a seasonal variation in in what we see, and and everyone accepts that that you need a yearly, um, you know, a yearly flu vaccine. So I think that it was probably naive to think that that with COVID it was going to be different, um, and I think that it, you know, we we also know a lot from our. Uh, 
I mean, from our knowledge of, of other coronavirus infections. So uh, we tend to forget that that sort of 30% of our seasonal upper respiratory tract infections that our children bring home from their creches or their daycares or their schools are, are caused by coronaviruses. And, and in fact, the immunity to these even is short lived with with kids often being infected, you know, sort of two or three times in a season. So so I think that I, I think whilst it was probably disappointing and, and whilst it seems to have caused a lot of um, yeah, a, a lot of insecurity and, and mistrust amongst patients. Um, I don't think it's. I mean, I, I think we should have expected that that we were going to need more than than one vaccine and 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 possibly regular vaccines. Um, it's a really difficult thing to discuss with patients now because I think there is so much uncertainty. Um, as you've alluded to, what what strain do you choose? Um, uh, what subvariant? You know, what variant? What subvariant? We you know the, uh, which which part of the world do you target at which time? And and this very real concern that are we not just going to end up chasing our tails? Um, are we not going to end up, you know, the, the, not just the, the manufacture or, or at least the, the concept of a new vaccine, but the upscale of it, the, you know, the widespread production, the distribution of it. We saw that this was a problem with the first one. And then absolutely, as you mentioned, patient hesitancy for, for uptake. So I, I think that, I mean, this is certainly not something that I, I think there's a lot more um, we need a lot more answers from the scientific community before this is a grassroots um, discussion to have with our patients, is, is my opinion. I think I think what will end up happening is, is we will have to target um, specific you know, areas of the population and say that you know, these people are more at risk. Um, and, and again, that, you know, that might change. I think we, we know obviously our elderly, our diabetic population, um, uh, we, we, know, we, we knew very, you know, very clearly who were at risk um, and children seem to be relatively spared. Uh, you know, would, it, would it stay like that? And as you mentioned, um, you know, the, this Omicron very much an idea that it was a, a way you know, milder, more self-limiting. Was this because of the, the, the variant itself? Was this just because of wider spread immunity? It's really hard to, to answer these questions um, now. And I think that this, you know, these, are the, these are the sort of things that will be uh, extrapolated and, and you know, uh, uh, looked at in, in hindsight. So, so I, 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 you know, I think that it's a very difficult question. How do you get a patient to take a vaccine? Um, how, do you get a, how do you get a person to take a vaccine? I, I think there's been two very polarized responses. There's been these, you know, people who absolutely can't wait to take it and people who say they wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. And it's interesting how it's ended up like that. And and I think that you know we as as healthcare professionals we also came out very strongly with this got to have a vaccine, um, you know and, and and I think that the the question now is is yeah how how important is it is it important for everybody, um, uh, I think that you know if you're going to choose a, a variant create a vaccine your the 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 logistical issues with with distributing that widely enough globally and getting good enough uptake to actually. You know, to make these these individual vaccine um, decisions, it's it's going to be extremely challenging, and I, I do think we'd end up probably just playing catch up. So, in my mind, I think that at the end of the day, we'll have to, uh, much like we do with with influenza, you'll have to identify your vulnerable populations, and you'll have to focus on on those groups, um, and 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 hopefully, you know, miss miss. The, the other thing to say is is what was very interesting to us as clinicians. It, you know, we started seeing this in the third wave where, um, you know, with Delta, where, where people were extremely ill, our hospital admissions were high, people were, were, you know, filling up our wards and being field hospitals, everyone was lying next to one another. And, and we could see so clearly the fact that the patients who'd had vaccines were doing well, um, either, you know, not being admitted in the first place or, or, or do, you know, very short stays doing well on oxygen whilst their counterparts lying next door who hadn't a vaccine, had a vaccine, were, were deteriorating and, and very often not making it. Um, and, and this had such a huge impact on the patients themselves that the, the patients that made you know that that walked out of there. The first thing they did was go and get a vaccine, and um, and take all of their friends to to do it too. So I think I think people first have to see the usefulness in an intervention. And I think unfortunately now, um, you know, with the idea that that the the vaccine has, has been quite 
poor in, in preventing infections, as, as you mentioned, sort of really only about 10% of infections. So I think if we want to get widespread uptake of this, it needs to be sold, A, as, as, as you rightly point out, this, this decreases hospital admission. We've seen that. It decreases ICU admission, it decreases intubation and ventilation, and it certainly decreases de death. Um, and I think that that's what we need to focus on. Um, uh, uh, people need to see the usefulness in, a, in an intervention. And then I think the other thing that we could probably use is, is, is apply to, to sort of people's sense of altruism in community is, is that, you know, if we have a, a successful widespread vaccine program with quick uptake, um, you know, you, you will decrease transmission and, and that will, um, uh, you know, protect your vulnerable, um, uh, uh, um, you know, sort of as, as, a, as, a, as a secondary outcome. So, so I think probably um, going forward, we'd have to target specific groups because it's, it's almost an impossible logistic task otherwise um, uh, we'd have to focus on the fact that that it prevents severe disease and death and 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 probably the idea that you know that protecting you know loved ones and, and those around you um, uh, could you know vaccines are, are an important intervention in, in that sense um, yeah I, I think that's 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 I'd, I'd be very interested to hear what what others comments are thanks dr okay so dr Pele, any thoughts on how we get our populations, and of course, you know, you're probably a good person to speak on this issue, dealing with, of course, mental health issues, but uh, and microbiology as well being your focus area. But how do we get people to appreciate and understand the threat, and also the need to be vaccinated? And how do we get to, you know, to change people's minds? And you know, this is quite an emotional issue, as all of us know. What's your perspective on this? Dr. Pillay, you may be on mute in case you're speaking. I'm on mute. Sorry about that. I spoke and I was on mute. Yeah. I still do that mistake all the time. Prof, thank you so much for asking me, asking me this question. In terms of vaccination, I think uh, firstly, what people need is perspective. And I think initially vaccines were oversold, that you take a vaccine and you'll be immune and that for life. The other thing about vaccines, unlike the common cold, a uh, corona is, is a rapidly mutating vaccine. Uh, the, my supervisor for my PhD, Prof. Emil Public, actually, corona has been around forever. Let's get that right. He did some, a lot of the work on, if people don't know, before COVID became a big thing, corona was the number one cause of recurrent infections when people flew on an aeroplane. And that's because that even with the hepatofilters that Boeing has, it was able to bypass that. And that will bring me to a topic of are masks really effective later, because they aren't, um, is that it is a rapidly, by nature, evolving and mutating creature. And it's been rapidly mutating and evolving forever. I mean, we got COVID-19, which was just a very virulent strain that was deadly and killed many people. But it occurs in the context of a bug that's rapidly mutating. So. What do we do from a psychiatric aspect? We, we've literally got to redefine a new campaign that where we identify at-risk populations and get them vaccinated. And, you know, in an ideal world, I have to do my genomics thing because I'm a, a microbiology genomist. Um, to say it, it's a pity that we can't get more people to do genomic assessments because if you do genomics, you know exactly who needs to be vaccinated and who doesn't. Because the reality of it, um, vaccines are good for a lot of people, but vaccines are bad for some people. And it, it really depends on a person's genomics and the genomics of COVID and COVID response are actually, actually quite well, well documented because we've been working with Corona for years. And we've also been working with the genomic changes within, uh, within the... Uh, the uh, the genomic chain within the COVID or the, well, the corona organism. So what we need is a, a more, a message with more perspective going on out there is that we will never be able to keep up with an organism that rap, that mutates so many times in a year. I, I just don't see that impo uh, being possible because by the time you create the next vaccine, we have, uh, 
uh, Corona X or Corona Z, and then we've run out of the letters of the alphabet. So we'll have Z.1 and Z.2. So I can't see how the industry with the necessary safety things can keep up. So we'll have to gain a perspective and tell people, look, if you're at high risk, this is what you do, get vaccinated, boost your immune system. But it's very important that we direct it in a way where people understand and are taken along with us. One of the biggest problems from us at the medical perspective is that we were tended to be quite dictatorial to patients and you can't dictate to a patient what they need. You have to have patients buy into the process. So we have to start a, com a, a campaign that is more patient-centered and based on the perspective of buying in. Why is it important to you? And also we've got to buy into the fact that people have freedom of choice. You know, we can't impose and we can't dictate on people because if you impose and dictate on people, people become rebellious. We all have rebellious children within ourselves. So from a psychiatric perspective, A, we've got to change the way we chat to people about vaccinations. Yes, it does help but not everybody. And there's also a danger if you are vaccinated too often, you get immune dysfunction. If you take vaccines often enough, the body's immune system will think that, that Corona is normal and stop, uh, stop responding to it. Uh, we in our labs, we do AI, MLS, have, have done simulations that, that that does occur. So balance and perspective is essential. The next things in terms of masks, Corona can bypass a patrofilter. So unless you're wearing a well-worn N95, the, the mask is more psychological than anything else. I mean, it's a, as my one prof puts it, she's a rather slim and sexy virus that gets through most things. I mean, she, she, uh, Corona as a, uh, as a virus bypassed and a patrofilter. So again, with that, we need perspective. Uh, and what were the benefits of the mask versus the negatives of the mask? From a psychiatric perspective, masks are a disaster, especially for developing children. So what we need is perspective and balance, not anti-mask, not pro-mask, but who needs a mask and who doesn't need a mask? And if you do need a mask, we need a proper mask. I think a lot of things, we people did it with the best of intentions, but a lot of things were healthcare measures without the proper scientific analysis and basis. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. That is helpful. Thank you so much. I think I want to maybe just before I move on to Dr. Minion, I just want to get uh, Ms. Ekeyan uh, Yanwu's perspective on how do we communicate the latest updates on science. You know, as I said, I've given you a very brief overview on where, you know, science is right now on, and where regulators are. And one of the major challenges is that, you know, if a regulator and followed up by a, you know, science or a clinical policy uh, committee, for example, in the US, we have the US FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, making decisions about, you know, authorizing an additional boost, but the clinical guidance is done by the US Centers for Disease Control. So you've got the clinical guidance now following suit and saying that we need you know, an additional booster dose, but more importantly, the booster dose needs to be a modified ingredient. But the major issue is that once those decisions get made, and it's going to take several months for that to happen, so it's not going to be immediately Pfizer's or, you know, Moderna, similarly in the US is also saying we'll try to get this done in the next few months. But the challenge here, of course, is that, you know, by then there may be a new variant out, and they've all done this in the context of, of the beta variant initially. And you know, that was the first time that they actually had started to produce a vaccine that is specific to a variant. But how, you know, by then, even if it is outdated or outdated or not, the challenge is how do we get the average person? So we've had two clinicians speak so far, but you know, the media is quite important in getting this, you know, this role across. And of course, science reporters are extremely important in terms of trying to explain science in a way that the average layperson can understand. And in a balanced way, outlining, of course, what are the potential benefits, what are the potential risks and the potential futility, but how do you do this in a way that will actually, you know, give a perspective of where we are in a realistic way. Uh, so, you know, that's a major challenge that, of course, the, that the, probably the media faces. So maybe we'll just get a media perspective on this. And then I want to come to Dr. Minion and ask him maybe 
uh, and slowly change this because we're going to have an open discussion session just now, but I'm trying to, of course, unpack as many of the issues so that the, the audience who's attending can actually have a field day and, and maybe, of course, ask wider questions from what we're speaking about. So maybe what I'll just do is just get, before we speak to Dr. Munion and what I want to ask her, is just get an idea from you in terms of what, um, you know, what the media and how do you communicate science in a way that is accessible to an average layperson and not to even, you know, a, a person with post school qualifications, but the average layperson who in fact may have no education or very little education and getting people to understand this in a way, because, you know, the media is quite broad. We've got print media, we've got social media, we've got, of course, uh, you know, the regular television as well, but how sh should the media portray this need to get vaccinated and the evolving science in a way that's accessible. The second Yanu. Yeah. So um, just generally, as there is as a fallout of COVID-19, I think that there's a there's a deepened trust in science and scientists, basically. And um, so I think it's really important as journalists, as science communicators generally, to push out the accurate message. Um, and humanize these stories as well. Um, I think that oftentimes we, we just, so as you say, we complicate issues, not, not complicated issues, but science is sometimes in heavy language. It's a lot of jargon that people don't understand. And um, explaining the science of vaccines in simple to understand clear language would be very helpful. But also in talking to people who have received the vaccine, humanizing, the stories and, and, and then going to the field and talking to people who have received the vaccines and then letting them well, talk about how effective the vaccines were for them in preventing severe COVID or you know, severe infections um, can be helpful in, um, in vaccine, in media vaccine campaigns generally. Um, also, Presenting the science as unfolding, I think, is important because the guidelines are constantly changing. If from the first instance we let them know that there will be updates because this is a virus that mutates, and for that reason, there will be updates in the guidelines that the scientists are going to put out there. It's, it's important um, because otherwise, I mean, for instance, there were times when we would see reports on the media about people doubting the efficacy of vaccines because where they because even though um, they found that their relatives or people around them were receiving the vaccines they were still coming down with COVID and then letting them understand that uh, that this virus is a mutating one and that we can't we may not be able to keep up with the way that it changes and its DNA and its uh, RNA or any of those but explaining the concept of these of changing viruses and then um, how it's not a fixed um issue and it's one that is unfolding explaining the fluidity of this situation would be very helpful in in how in getting people to trust what we what the information that we put out there um and, uh, as i said again it's also important to talk to the people who have got the vaccines um to to basically and uh, and yeah and to explain to them um the so oftentimes so i know that there was a point in time where we talked about um the, when pfizer and biotech announced their covid19 vaccine and then there was this research that went in that went out and said they had a 90 percent efficacy rate and it wasn't uh we it didn't it wasn't a it wasn't a peer-reviewed study um and then many many outfits still published that claim and until the science journalists, the, the ones who understand the science, basically, who are speaking with the scientists, came to clear up the issue, that information was out there. Um, it's important for us to understand what the scientists know. Um, and it's, it's true that we do not have time in the newsroom, but it's important also to take our time to understand the, the way this whole, the whole COVID-19 vaccines are unfolding and the science behind vaccines generally, especially with a virus like COVID-19, I'm sorry, the like coronavirus that has um, existed in the past, providing the context 
and placing it within a, a wider a, a wider scope of that of the virus existing prior to now and often and it's uh, it can it can definitely change uh, just i think it's getting the people to understand that this isn't a static situation uh, and that there will always be changes and updates to the guidelines it's important for this for people to know this from the onset um, and it's important to humanize the stories and get people just talking to people on the ground about um, their experiences with the vaccine, I think. Um, so I guess uh, that's, that, that's what I would say for now. Okay, so uh, maybe what we can just do is very quickly get Dr. Munion's perspective on something which I'm going to slowly shift the discussion now. And, you know, we, with COVID, we've got a major challenge in terms of getting people to still take the pandemic seriously some people of course have in their minds anyway see this in their review mirror but of course you will already know that as you look in the review mirror we've got the next pandemic that's seemingly unfolding and at this point in time it's definitely not you know it won't be classified by international norms as a pandemic in the regular sense of the word it's more an outbreak and we've got a monkeypox outbreak now in more than 30 countries around the world and just I'll give you a very, very quick overview, and then I want to get Dr. Minion's perspective on this. But of course, you know, with the current mon monkeypox outbreak, the WHO took a decision a few days ago last week, in fact, that it, this is not yet at the point of declaring this an international health emergency. So it's not yet at that point in time. But of course, the number of cases is beginning to rise quite, you know, relatively rapidly. And we've already got two known cases in South Africa. The suspicion is that as in South Africa, as in elsewhere, the number of actual cases may be in fact higher. But of course, you know, what we do know is that monkeypox is a, normally is a disease that you'd find in Africa. And it's not, of course, linked to monkeys. It's just that that was where it was first really noticed. And so it got that unfortunate name. The WHO is now in the process of looking at changing the name of the virus and you know, there's lots of stigma attached to it now. It seems to be linked to Africa. But of course, you know, what has happened and very quickly and just by way of overview is that what has happened is that while Nigeria has had a monkeypox outbreak since 2017 and it's been just rolling on uh, for a number of years under the radar, not really making international news. What we do have now is a, you know, is a disease that's actually spread beyond West Africa. What we do know at this point in time is that this is a West African strain, the two strains, but more importantly, is that this seems to be something that in fact has changed quite a lot since you know, what we know about it from the 2017 outbreak. And what we do know at this point in time, you know, early evidence is showing that the latest outbreak of monkeyboxes you know, that's spreading around the world seems to be quite actually a changed virus again from what we knew it to be. And at this point in time, what seems to be evident is that the current outbreak of monkeypox has about 50 different new mutations that didn't actually exist a few years ago. And it's these 50 mutations that are in fact fueling an accelerated spread of monkeypox. And what we do know, of course, is that at this point in time, you know, these are mainly theories at this point in time, but the outbreak, the current outbreak that we've seen globally seems to have at this point in time, you know, there may have been a super spread event possibly in Europe. It's, is what evidence seems to be pointing to. And that outbreak, of course, has now gone global. There were several events that may have taken place in Europe that they may in fact have seen, uh, that, you know, that, that scientists have actually tried to peg and public health experts have tried to not peg as potentially the origin point of the latest outbreak. And of course, that one outbreak, when you have an international event, it then, of course, those people go home and it spreads. And at this point in time, the outbreak seems to be linked to a few different uh, communities in particular, and that's where it seems to be, in a sense, concentrated in. But I think what I wanted to just maybe focus on here is that what has become quite evident is that an outbreak that can be quite small or relatively small and may not necessarily go very far in terms of global outreach can quickly become a global pandemic in our current day and age, where you have, of course, international flights and where pandemic or future pandemic can start off as a minor one or two cases, then it becomes an outbreak and from an outbreak it becomes an epidemic and from an epidemic it becomes a pandemic because it starts spreading globally. And you know, we of course now are beginning to wonder what type of measure, measure should we be taking and what sort of, you know, um, what type of measure should we be taking at a public health level, but also 
you know, we do know at this point in time, the COVID pandemic has had quite a marked impact on the tourism industry in South Africa and globally. And, you know, we see empty shops, we see a lot of people in the tourism sector, in the arts sector have actually lost their jobs. And it's very difficult for them to now get their foot back in again. And a similar concern is beginning to emerge now in the context of, you know, the monkeypox outbreak. And of course, with the COVID outbreak, the cruise ship industry has still not recovered. It's, uh, you know, it's going to take a while for that to happen. Uh, the growth of the flight industry has started to slowly tick upwards. But as a you know, prime example, as I said, the cruise ship industry was very stigmatized right at the start of the pandemic. That's where the outbreaks were first seen and amplified in a, in a much more, you know, uh, vivid way in the press. And similarly, now we've got a similar type of phenomenon arising with the monkeypox outbreak. And I think, you know, one of the major challenges that we have with COVID and with monkeypox, and, you know, this is what I think I'll, I'll leave this open session up for those who are attending to maybe raise these issues, and I'm happy to facilitate that. But I think one of the challenges that we have right now is that how do we ensure that certain sectors and certain communities don't get stigmatized with the monkeypox outbreak? And the reason why I'm emphasizing this is that at this point in time, the outbreaks in Europe seem to have originated, possibly anyway, these are the different hypotheses that have been put forward in certain sexual networks. And so they may have been either a party or they may have been a sauna, or they may have been different events where men who have sex with men may have actually been one of the points where the pandemic started in Europe and where it's now spread. And the major challenge, of course, at the WHO and among scientists and clinicians around the world is to try to emphasize that monkeypox is not a sexually transmitted infection. It's not confined to men who have sex with men. It's just that these were the networks that this in fact started with and spread. And that venues that uh, men who have sex with men frequent may not necessarily be at high risk and should not be stigmatized. But you know, it's a major challenge. And of course, I thought I'd get Dr. Minion's view on this because you know, we're looking at COVID-19, learning lessons from there. It's devastated the world in many, many different respects. You know, and I think your field of speciality is a you know is, is an important field here to maybe give some input on because you're looking at geographical spaces, you're looking at environmental issues, and what we do know is that as human habitation increases and the stress on the natural environment increases as well, there's going to be more contact between wild animals and zoonotic diseases and humans. And one of the challenges, of course, which is what you face and focus on as well and that we're now facing with the monkeypox outbreak is this is probably, hopefully not going to have a major out, you know, input or it may not hopefully anyway, have a major impact on the tourism sector, but it may. And already we're looking at potential stigma and the major challenge is how do we now address these different issues in a way, what lessons have we learned from COVID to ensure that the same does not have, happen with the monkeypox? So maybe I thought I'd actually start off by asking you that question. And then I think we'll I'll give her maybe a couple more comments and just open it up for uh, the, the people who are attending to maybe ask questions to everyone. So Dr. Minion, what's your views on this? Thank you, thank you, Prof. I think I'm going to start first. You, you did mention a very important aspect and I think we have to, almost emphasize this to it to until we're sick of hearing it and that's the impact of knowledge and how we translate information and how knowledge is digested across the different spectrums you know you read an article saying that possibly uh, during sexual intercourse between males, that's the start of the event. But what somebody else in a different setting or in a different circumstance is going to take from that is very different. So I think this actually highlights the importance of how we use scientific information and especially in cases where we have pandemics and infectious diseases. How do we translate that information into different communication platforms, firstly, and how do we break that information down so it's digestible to different groups within our society? And I think that is a critical element. And no matter which pandemic or event we are referring to, if we can't get that right, all else seems to be somewhat lost because people aren't getting the information they required. People aren't getting the right information. People don't know what to do with that information. 
And we see the ripple effects of miscommunication. We see the ripple effects of people's manifestations or interpretations of scientific information in different groups. We see that impact in our society. We also see that impact when it comes to our preparedness and our responses to COVID-19. So I think the first point of call is actually to just emphasize the importance of knowledge, the transfer of that knowledge, and the platforms that we choose to actually get that knowledge disseminated to the different groups, particularly those vulnerable groups, those remote groups, those groups that aren't connected to mainstream media uh, uh, platforms. Um, in terms of the latter part of your question, or I think it could have been the first part of your question. Yes, we do live in a, in, in a, in a time where geography is compressed. Um, the notion, the, the, the travel flying faster, more frequently is part of society. And that brought with it a number of pros, economic development, linkages across the, the um, across uh, trade opportunities, opportunities for sharing, opportunities, social opportunities, but it also brings with it a darker side and that is exposure to these sorts of elements, whether it's infectious diseases um, or different types of ideologies or um, exposure to some of the darker sides of our society. And I think those elements we tend to ignore a lot. Um, yes, COVID-19 did have a profound impact on the tourism sector. A lot of tourism is built on that connection, that taking a flight and traveling to different parts or getting into your vehicle and traveling to different parts. But when there was a restriction on flights and the travel bans, and also when we entered a lockdown, we couldn't do those things. And so a lot of those activities and a lot of those uh, economic activities just collapsed. Um, in the tourism sector, we see uh, a varied sort of response to COVID-19. Some sectors thrive, some sectors have remodeled themselves, they've entered new or redesigned their product offerings so they can move on to, uh, uh, for example, on online uh, services. But there are some sectors that are still struggling, like the creative and cultural uh, industries. Where do artists perform in a lockdown? And I think, you know, when it's a very difficult uh, or very sort of, yeah, it's very difficult waters to navigate. You want to do the best for your community. You want to do the best for society in terms of protecting them from these sorts of illnesses. But also there is that other front. Um, what do people do after that? We all need to survive. And I think, you know, this brings me back to um, monkeypox, for example. We've underestimated the impact of the lockdown socioeconomically. And just to bring to your attention, another aspect that is really emerging strongly within the South African context is food security. Food security amongst our marginalized, marginalized groups, never mind marginalized groups, but also in pushing into the lower income and the middle income categories now for the first time. Yes, it could be a consequence of the economic recession that we're all going, that we're seeing more and more, but no doubt COVID has also contributed to that. But just keeping in line with that aspect of all the unknowns that we don't see, um, the fact that we can't engage in economic activity, the ripple effect of that is that you can't afford food. And the ripple effect of that is you're going to seek alternate resources. Now, in a space that's so connected, the consumption of meat and different products or unique products, I would call it, in the absence of our uh, staple mainstream uh, food items. What about the new issues that that brings to the fore? Because it's, it's the same thing with monkeypox. You know, it's the transmission of these diseases and it's the understanding that when one sort of system fails, there is room to create new pathways so people can survive and people can do these things, uh, live, for example, um, sustain themselves. And I think when we're looking at 
COVID and monkeypox, for example, we have to always also consider the different pathways for infection, the different pathways for exposure, and no doubt geography and socioeconomic uh, conditions contribute to that greatly. Um, I'm looking forward to the discussion with the, with the group. So I, I'm gonna stop there for now. And perhaps this sort of sparks some more questions amongst our attendees so that we can engage in um, conversation. So, okay, thank Great. you. Thank you so much, Dr. Minion. So, you know, I wanna leave this open to the wider group to maybe put your questions to the panelists. And I'm sure anybody else who's welcome to respond as well. You know, this is an open session. And uh, we encourage discussion and debate. And if people want to contribute to the answer, that's great as well. So you know, I'll leave it open now. But I think, you know what, the main point here is just to introduce what we want to talk about. We want to talk about, you know, where COVID-19 is at this point in time. How do we manage the evolution of COVID-19, the disease, but also, you know, the evolution of the disease is dependent on the evolution of the virus. But more importantly, in terms of we're looking forward now, you know, what do we do about emerging outbreaks that are coming up and that are happening right now, like monkeypox? And I think, you know, the issues that I'll leave you with just to maybe ponder on is at this point in time, uh, lots of affluent countries in Europe and North America, Canada, the US are looking at, you know, vaccinating their populations against monkeypox. There's, of course, not hundreds of thousands of stock, but there are different strategies in terms of how to vaccinate the population. And do you do a target sort of approach of only those populations at greatest risk and immediate context of those people. But, you know, this type of strategy now is a very different vaccination strategy from COVID-19, where we focused on the most vulnerable, the most high at risk. And when we're looking at now doing some sort of vaccination campaign for monkeypox, the challenges are, and I'll leave them open here for people to maybe follow up, is, you know, what do we do about who gets access to those vaccines? So what we do know is that the you know, the chickenpox vaccine seems to work to a certain degree anyway against monkeypox. It's about, I think, approximately 85% effective. But there are different vaccines that have been developed specifically for monkeypox. And the challenge now is how do we ensure equitable access to those vaccines? Another major challenge relating to vaccines is that, you know, we can't, of course, vaccinate the entire population. And what has been proposed as a strategy is something called ring vaccination. Ring vaccination is basically where you just target those people who are most at risk in terms of, you know, people already have been exposed or could be exposed. So in a sense, you focus on those people and vaccinate those communities. But that type of approach, and it was done very successfully with Ebola, but that type of approach, when you have, at this point in time, anyway, the pandemic or, you know, an emerging outbreak amongst just one community in particular, for example, men who have sex with men, it could end up stigmatizing that population. And it could also end up with other population groups who may be at risk, then trivializing the risk in their mind, saying, oh, well, it's only those people, we are not at risk of this. So, you know, there are challenges with, first of all, getting access to vaccines, but second of all, how do we do a rollout and who do we target is a major challenge as well. You know, so these are some of the emerging issues coming up in the context of monkeypox. And, you know, I'll leave this open for the group now. And of course, you know, the third element, which somebody looked at the, you know, the, I just looked at some of the comments in the chat and apologies for not noticing this earlier, but I'll introduce it now in terms of the, you know, content that we can maybe focus on. But, you know, what we do know is that COVID-19 has had a major impact on other health conditions. We've had people not turn up for the medication, not turn up for other vaccinations. It's been something that has really impacted non COVID related diseases. It's impacted on people getting access to the, for example, HIV treatment, TB treatment. It's had a major impact. And I think the challenge going forward is how do we ensure that access to other types of healthcare are not neglected and that there's not an overemphasis and exceptionalization of one pandemic or one disease over others? So, you know, I'm leaving these as open questions here, and I'm very happy to you know, to facilitate a discussion on this issue. So if anybody wants to maybe raise their hand, you are welcome to do so now. And you can ask any of the panelists particular questions that you may have. Alternatively, you know, I can read out questions that you put in the chat, but whatever you prefer. So um, I think if anybody wants to ask a question, I'm happy to take your question now. And 
as I said, you can maybe raise your hand and then we'll take it in that way. Edwin, I see your hand is up first, so I'm happy to take your comment first. Hi, Prof. Sorry, it's a great discussion so far. Thank you very much. I just wanted to let you know that there is a question in the Q&A and there was another in the chat. So maybe the, those two could give us a kickstart in terms of taking it forward. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And apologies again for not seeing the q and I think because I'm facilitating, I've actually had an open screen and was looking at different things. And so of course I missed the chat here, but I'll just read out some of the questions that have come up here. And you know maybe one of the issues that has come up is just to give you the two questions here. One is, you know, how do we, um, you know, is China's zero tolerance approach the correct one or not is one question. And of course, you know, somebody else had also put in a question here, looking at the impact of, of COVID-19 on treatment and, you know, the accessing treatment, for example, for HIV, picking up treatment. And, you know, so in terms of the impact on the wider healthcare system is one issue. The other question is relating to the zero tolerance approach. And is that the right strategy or not? So I'm not sure if anybody wants to take up those two, either of those two questions, but, uh, I'm happy for any of the panelists. So Dr. Potkitter, I see your hand is up. Which one would you like to handle? Or you can handle both if you want, but your hand Thanks, is up. Ravna. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I thought I could, could chat about the, the access to HIV and, and, and TB treatment during the pandemic. I think it's an excellent question. Um, and I, I think that this has not been unique only to, um, to HIV um, uh, medicine, um, that, 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 in, that the COVID pandemic has dramatically affected our healthcare system, as was alluded to um, by, by other panelists. Um, there have been a lot of studies now in the wake of, you know, these these first couple, you know, the, 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 the waves, looking at the impact of, of COVID-19 and lockdown on treatment initiation in the setting of HIV, on patient uh, uh, treatment collection, um, HIV specifically in the adolescent population. There's been a dramatic effect um, uh, uh, sort of what we, we've been terming collateral damage. There's been massive collateral damage. Um, uh, and I think this isn't, as I say, isn't unique to, to HIV TB. Um, anecdotally, uh, you know, that's obviously the, the area that I read around, but chatting with colleagues in oncology, um, you know, they, they were seeing half the number of, of new malignancies um, uh, being diagnosed during COVID, uh, you know, and and I think that you know the patients didn't disappear; they were just not making it to to adequate levels of care, um, and and subsequently, you know, just a severe disease presentation. So we've we've seen you know horrible di diabetic control, um, appalling hypertensive control. So all our chronic diseases, um, and and pr and probably some of our acute diseases and emergencies, I think have been have been hugely affected by this concept of COVID collateral damage, where resources um, were, were distributed towards COVID, but, but also, you know, with the lockdowns, people just not being able to adequately access care. And then, and then again, the, the effect of, of illness on our, um, on our healthcare professionals. I mean, there've been many uh, points in time where we've we battle to fill call rosters um, and, and find enough doctors and, and, and nurses to, to actually administer care because so many were, you know, either ill or, or, or um, quarantining. Um, and I, I think that, um, and I think that these, you know, the effects of this we will see for a long time in the future. You mentioned the excess deaths um, and, and, and uh, you know, that, that's, that's almost two to three times what would have been reported. And, and I think that certainly some of these, um, uh, you know, apart from just the underreported COVID, some of these might also be attributed to, um, you, you know, to, to this this sort of concept of collateral damage, where the rest of the healthcare system is, has just taken a hammering. Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. If there might be other comments from other panelists. Great. I see Dr. Pillay's hand is up as well. Sorry, I forgot to unmute, unmute as usual. Uh, uh, Prof, I just have two comments. And firstly, uh, you know, everybody discriminates against psychiatry and forget the commonest chronic illnesses are psychiatric. And, and it's the same thing for psychiatric illnesses. You know, all our chronic depressives, chronic bipolar, chronic schizophrenics did not take their treatments adequately and got more stressed by living in social isolation. So the, the approach to treating COVID has had a negative impact on generalized overall care. The other thing that we've got to realize in life, we've, we've got to adopt a balanced social pragmatic approach to things. 
We can't zone in on a perfect treatment for COVID if the population then starves to death. We have to balance society's needs. And yes, sometimes we might have to compromise the giving perfect treatment for COVID so that society grows, grows as a whole. My one fear with COVID, and I've seen it now, uh, you know, I was also overzoned initially. I, I, I must admit, I'm human. I got too zoned in in COVID and walked around in a spacesuit in the hospital. But if you look at it in perspective two years later, what are we seeing is that by treating COVID so perfectly, we neglected society as its own. And I agree with Dr. Munyan, you know, what about food, food, water, services? We neglected the servicing of our cities. We neglected the maintenance of our cities. Uh, we neglected everything. And we cannot neglect society's needs to just focus on COVID. It's gonna be here long-term. And it's very important that we pro provide ourselves with balanced uh, treatment, even if the balance means that we're not going to have 100% perfect treatment for COVID. It's no use keeping everybody alive from COVID and they die from hunger or die from mental illness or they commit suicide from their bipolarity or depression or go psychotic from their schizophrenia. Thanks. That's right. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Pocket. I see your hand up again. Sorry, I only put it up because I saw that there weren't any other hands up. Um, I, I, oh, I would love great. to, yeah, just just um, second um, uh, what Dr. Pillay and Dr. Munyan have said. I, I completely agree. And I think that um, this this speaks to one of the questions in the chat. In fact, there were two questions in the chat. The first was China's zero tolerance policy, which I think is a, hor is a horrible idea. Um, uh, I mean, we can uh, we can we can talk about that, but I, I think that um, I think that one of the most important um, lessons from this pandemic has been the need to be flexible, to adjust our policies as um, as the pandemic progresses, as new information is is made available, um, and and that also speaks to the dropping of our mask mandate, which I also think, from our government's point of view, was an excellent call and and possibly even too late. I think if you look at our seroprevalence studies, where ninety eight percent of our patients have got um, a, a immunity. And in fact, only 10% of those were from vaccine alone. Um, it's obviously difficult to know which were from infection alone, because you're obviously going to get both, you know, both types of antibodies. But if you look at our seroprevalence data, the whole country has had COVID. Uh, we, you know, we were masking vigilantly um, uh, initially, and 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 that had that had no effect. I mean, the masks weren't worn in the right context. They weren't the correct masks. Um, and and I think that uh, so so I think that our um, our decision to 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 relax um, all of these regulations has has been, if anything, too late. And and I think again, seconding what Dr. Minion and Dr. Pillay have said, that the the collateral damage on our our um, our economic platforms, on our food security. Security platforms um, uh, and on our healthcare um, platform, I, I think that um, I think that that um, that the recent changes have, are, are extremely welcomed um, by, by most of the scientific community in South Africa. Great. So I'm just going to come back to a question that has been put already, and uh, I see Dr. Munian's hand is up. I'm not sure if she's going to be tackling one of the questions that's come up or some of the other ones that are now coming up in the chat. But uh, Dr. Munian. Yes, hi. I am going to address one of the questions that's come up in the chat. Uh, firstly, we had a question from Fawzia, and I think I did respond, but Nkulisi, you also said, um, do you think South Africa's latest move on masks is influenced by scientific consideration or our inability to manage the economy? Um, many people around the world, I think, have decided, or many countries around the world have decided to do away with the masks. I mean, there's. it depends which spectrum you look at or which side you consider, but there are some research suggesting the side effects of the mask and there are some research suggesting the pros of the mask. But I think the bigger issue here is it's not, it's about how do we now resource our communities or our population to deal with the current condition? What do we need to provide them to function within the space? The space has changed. Your, your safety has changed. We shouldn't, 
I think it, 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 uh, it, it's good to look back and reflect, but we should be forward looking and we should be thinking about, okay, so this is the way the current situation is. This is what it is. We can't change that right now. But what we can change is how we respond to it and how we respond to it should be more proactive rather than a knee-jerk reaction. So when things go wrong, then we're like, okay, you got to mask up again or we got to enter another lockdown. Rather, we should be talking about let's inform our population adequately so that they make informed decisions. And a lockdown, yes, it may have worked in the first couple of months, but as um, Dr. Potheta said, it was the relaxation of the lockdown was way too late. We have two um, economies characterizing South Africa. We have the formal economy and the informal economy. And a large portion of our population belong to the informal economy that don't have income security, that don't have a stable salary at the end of every month. So that group needed to work. That group needed to get back into gear and they needed to start to support their livelihoods. I think we've got to change the, the questions. I think we've got to change the background a little bit or the space a little bit. Let's start talking about what can we do differently or how should we be doing things instead? Um, and I think that might be more useful because we're not gonna evade or escape these sorts of events whether they be it in the near future, or we, we, you know, even currently, we can't escape COVID. It's been three years long. And imagine if somebody couldn't earn for three years. And Khaleesi, you had a second part of your question, which is, there seems to be an increase in reliance on government aid. Well, if you're not getting income and government is providing support, that should be your first point of call. But let us not also forget that within South Africa, and this might not be as widely known, is that a large portion of many households depend on state aid, state grants. Now that's a very unhealthy dependency for any economy, let alone a developing economy. And I think we always have to be critical and more aware of the context around the need for state funding or state support for households. There's been huge debate around what child grants or um, especially child grants and disability grants are being spent on. And there is some talk around moving towards things like vouchers instead of cash. So I think we've got to be critical and I think we've got to also be uh, introspective in, 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 in sort of paving the way forward. Thanks. Great. So I, I see another uh, one of our panelists has actually put up his hand, but I think before we do that, we've just I'm just going to quickly read out some of the other questions because of course we're rapidly running out of time now. But uh, Prof. Anshu Bediachi has actually put in a question, and so you know I think probably one of the important issues that comes up, as well as an overall theme, is you know how has the pandemic been managed in South Africa? It's come up indirectly in the context of the answers that have come up now from the panelists, but in particular, how should South Africa and especially the Ministerial Advisory Committee advise government on this matter for the future. So I think you know one of the major challenges has been how have how has our government managed the pandemic? And I think you know just to give you a quick overview here, so that we're all on the same page. You know we've got quite a quite a, in a, in compared to other countries, quite a convoluted structure in terms of how we manage the pandemic. You know we've got the a war room in a sense that's been established. The, Coronavirus Command Council, and that receives input from premiers and from, of course, you know, the from may, metro mayors and from a whole range of other considerations. And then separately, you've got advisory groups like the Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID nineteen. But you've also got three other MACs. We've got a vaccine MAC. We've got a social uh, MAC that also advises on issues. So we've got all these different parallel advisory structures. But of course, those advisory structures advise the Ministry of Health in particular, who then take those inputs and then take it to the wider cabinet. And the cabinet will then endorse or not the recommendations that come from the Coronavirus Command Council. So we've got quite a layered way of, of dealing with things. And of course, as we know, whenever there were new lockdowns announced or relaxations, there was a very long consultation process that preceded that. So, you know, I think the open question here is, has government managed the process effectively have they been responsive to the latest science 
Have they been responsive to the concerns of society? Have they been timely in the way that they've responded to things? Have they taken input from certain sectors more than others? You know, these are some of the open questions here. So I'm not sure if anybody wants to, you know, maybe look at that issue in particular, but I'll maybe go to Dr. Pele first and then Dr. Munyan's hand is up. I'm not sure if it's a historic hand or a new hand, but we'll maybe go the to that. So Dr. Pele. Okay, no problem. Thanks. Dr. Pele. I think you're on mute again. Sorry, I'm the king of unmuting. It's my, I must add it to my CV. Uh, look, my, my answer will address uh, Prof's, uh, Prof's questions quite pertinently. Uh, but first I have to open with this statement. Uh, there, are, there are three bigger pandemics that Africa faces on a chronic basis and it does not mutate. We have the uh, pandemic of poverty, we have got the pandemic of unemployment and we have the pandemic of hunger. Now, in this context, I am going to address prop. I, I think the South African government did relatively well. Let me explain why. The science wasn't there. The science was per, wasn't perfect. So it was a bit of a juggling act to get it right. And there, there would have been no perfect way to handle it. It's, we can't talk in hindsight. Hindsight is a very perfect sight. But we, were, we must say, what were the facts available to them then? And the honestly, truth is, the facts weren't available. The science wasn't ready. And they had to act on available information. But what was wrong? The wrong part is the three more deadly pandemics were not addressed. They did not address the pandemic of poverty, the pandemic of hunger, and the pandemic of unemployment. In Africa, if you're addressing any infectious disease, it's very important to give equal weight to poverty, hunger, and, and unemployment. Forget the negative impact it has mentally on people. Yes, for psychiatrists, it has a huge negative people impact on people being hungry, unemployed, or, or in the depths of poverty. But I think that was just the path that was not uh, correctly, or enough weight wasn't placed on that. And so I must agree. Uh, but perhaps they should have uh, released the restrictions earlier. The only purpose of the restrictions was to buy time to get our healthcare in place. And that was nice, but we're still dealing with the hangover of increased poverty, increased hunger, and increased unemployment. I hope that answers the question. Yes, great. And of course, you know, we've got to start wrapping up things soon. So I'm just going to quickly through take you through some of the other issues that have come up here. One of the questions that's come up is, do you think South Africa's efforts in trying to curb the spread and effect of COVID-19 has been well complemented by her neighbors? And how do you think the handling of COVID in neighboring countries has helped South Africa, has, has helped South Africa's cause? How big is monkeypox threat in your view? So I'm not sure if anybody wants to take those or any of the aspects of those questions, but I think the one unanswered question so far is that, you know, that's come up and maybe what I'll do is I'll just try to take a stab at this here. But one question that has come up is, you know, is, co is China's COVID zero, a zero tolerance policy the right approach? And I think, you know, what has been quite evident is that, you know, uh, this has, you know, it came up, I think, probably in global circles and as a discussion point that, until the Omicron variant emerged, China possibly was doing quite well in terms of their, their zero tolerance approach to COVID. So even one case is enough to shut down an entire city and you've got to keep it under control. But I think because Omicron and all its subvariants has been so transmissible, much more so than earlier variants, this becomes a policy that you've got to really look at whether it's realistic or not. And I think probably in the context of China, it's a very different type of country from other countries. It is possible in China because of the nature of the political system there to of course have these types of measures, but in open democracies where you can have challenges in court by civil society or from different groups, you're not going to find the zero tolerance approach probably working here. You know, we, in South Africa, we have a constitutional democracy based on different values. And of course, amongst them is the issue of, you know, an administrator, a, a minister, for example, 
has to make rational and reasonable decisions and decisions have to be evidence-based. And of course, as we know, we've had several court cases where government has been challenged on the rationality of its decisions, on the reasonableness of its decisions. We've had the minister in charge of, you know, at that point in time anyway, the Minister of Cooperative Governance and Kosozan Lamini Zuma taken to court over her promulgation of regulations relating to the ban on smoking. And of course, you know, there was earlier ban on the sale of alcohol that was lifted, but the smoking ban relatively recently was found to be irrational in court. And there's been no, the courts have found that there was no link to the banning of smoking in relation to the risk of COVID. And, you know, that type of approach wasn't taken in other countries. So I think, you know, in South Africa, we've got that ability to take the government to court. In China, that doesn't quite exist. You know, you have some people on social media maybe protesting, it's quickly killed off and those voices are silenced or their voices are censored on social media. So at this point in time, China's proceeding and, you know, there have been rumors anyway that China wants to continue with this for the next five years. And, you know, as somebody who works at a global level in global health, this is not seen to be something that's very feasible. It's a major second biggest economy in the world and you can't shut down an entire city when most other places in the world are beginning to adapt to live with the virus now. And I think China's initial approach was based on the hope that vaccines that China was producing, because at this point in time, non-Chinese vaccines are not accessible in China, but that Chinese vaccines would be effective in preventing and controlling COVID. As we know, not just for Chinese vaccines, but all vaccines have not been effective in preventing COVID. So at this point in time, you know, the approach has been based on the ancestral strain. It's probably not the right approach. It's not fit for purpose in terms of a highly transmissible strain like Omicron. And it's, you know, it's at this point in time, the zero tolerance approach, COVID zero as they call it, is probably causing more harm than good in China, in my personal opinion. And, you know, I think it's difficult for independent assessors to go in there and to do some sort of qualitative studies where they're interviewing people or a quantitative study where they're looking at the impact of allowing people to live lives and to manage the disease as other countries are. But at, you know, at, at this point in time, I'm just trying to take an attempt at an unanswered question. It's probably not a feasible approach with very highly transmissible strains of uh, Omicron and subvariants of Omicron. So I think you know, at this point in time, my opinion is that China's approach is probably not the optimal approach. It's one approach, but there are more optimal approaches that have been taken by other countries. And that is at some point in time, we're gonna to have to start living with the, you know, with the virus in society. And even with a highly vaccinated society, we're still having breakthrough infections. And you know, until we develop a vaccine that is probably gonna be a mucosal vaccine that's working on blocking infection full stop. And you know, there's several clinical trials, I won't go through them with you, but there's several clinical trials that are now looking at different vaccines and you know we're calling the second or next generation vaccines but they're looking at you know the nasal vaccines as an example where it may actually just stop you from getting COVID and you stop yourself from even getting the infection so you can't even spread it to other people so you know those are probably the emerging things on the horizon that I think our speakers you know, we'll have to look at it at some future point in time in their own practice and probably in terms of a future session uh, that they may come into. But, you know, we may have a new vaccines or new next generation vaccines on the horizon. And the big challenge is going to be getting people to, of course, accept that those vaccines are now going to be effective in breaking the cycle and transmission chain of COVID. So those vaccines are on the horizon. They're called, uh, you know, mucosal vaccines. And there's no successful clinical trial yet because they're still in progress. But one of the big challenges will be how do we get the population out to adapt, you know, to accept those vaccines over and above, maybe by then getting third and fourth doses of vaccines. But I see Dr. Munian's hand is up, and I just want to maybe come back to her very quickly before we start wrapping things up. Yes, I just want to say something in response to that. You know, we we talking about China's heavy hand on this whole COVID situation, but from a geographic point of view, if China has very high density, perhaps that is the right approach. Perhaps for that country, given their situation, given their context, perhaps that was the best way to curb the spread. And I think this brings me to a very important point, and it's about us responding within the confines of our context. Our responses 
our preparedness, our ability to overcome and probably cope with these pandemics is not so much based on what the world over is doing, but what our conditions are within our bound or within our geographic boundary. And if you don't have, like in the case of South Africa, if you don't have access to water, it doesn't matter what the rest of the world are doing. If you can't stay cleansed or you can't sanitize properly, that's always going to be an issue within your borders. I, I perhaps we need to be more introspective in that approach. We, I, I feel like, you know, uh, very quickly in some of my research, earlier research that I was doing, there was a case study that I picked up in China. The earlier lockdown did curb the spread, but there were some secondary effects. I mean, I picked up a case study where a child with, with cerebral palsy was left alone because both his parents were detained in the hospital and that child subsequently died. So there are these negative sort of impacts to any decision that we make. But I think the most important thing going forward here is that we make these decisions based on the best fit for the country. And what, and, and sadly, it has to be in terms of the best fit for, to get to be most effective for most of your population. I'm sorry, I don't wanna be too, um, Bold. No, that's, that's, that's fine. I'm just very conscious of the time. We've got four minutes left and we still, of course, have to hand over for, uh, you know, to, to our colleagues to maybe do some wrapping up here. But there was one question from Brendan, Brendan I do to Ogeshi and she says, please explain what pressure media face and how do we address the issue of fake news and science? So unfortunately, we've got like less than a minute to maybe quickly answer that question before we hand it over to uh, some of our partners to actually wrap up the session here because we're going to be getting, handing it over soon to higher education media services inside Ebnet. And uh, Ogesh, maybe you can maybe take over from here now if you want to. And I'm not sure if you're going to be speaking on behalf of Side Ebnet. And, uh, but I think probably if you want to just quickly answer the question of how do we handle you know, the issue of misinformation and fake news in science, that will be great. And then we'll quickly hand over to our partners. Okay, um, I, I actually did come with uh, an episode of our podcast, Side of Podcast, and then we would have served as a great case study on how to handle misinformation. Um, but since we don't have the time, maybe we'll drop the link uh, on the chat box, and then you'd be able to, anyone can see it later on, and then understand basically how we counter, counter fake news um, on our platform. But the truth is, yes, the media faces pressure, and that pressure is really time. Social media is prevalent now, and then the, the fake news spreads like wildfire in no time. It will go out, it will go out in in one minute and it spread everywhere. So that's one of the pressures, pressures that we face, countering fake news on social media on time and getting the kind of kind of reach that social media has. Um, so that's one thing that I know that traditional media faces. But um, countering fake news is so important to us. Um, and we can only do this with, we can only do this by engaging the science again and the scientists, which is why uh, a relationship, yes, which is why a relationship, uh, a strong relationship um, between scientists and journalists is, is important in countering fake news. So if we have access to the scientists, um, I see this is, how, this is one crucial way that um, the media generally, but this is one way that side of um, counters fake news, um, engaging the science, engaging the scientists, um, constantly following up and updating news and then the guidelines that the scientists have put in place um, is one way that we counter fake news. We also try to put out campaigns as well so that, um, what's it called, so that readers can identify so that their media literates themselves. We try to let them know that little campaigns like letting them understand that um, if a news does not have a news source, if there are no names, for instance, that we must, you must take it with a pinch of salt. Do not just as uh, consume, um, you know, news or, or information on social media platform without trying to put them through the lens of, uh, of verification or through a verification process, understanding, look at the sources that have been credited, for instance, are they, are they, are they worthy, are they, I mean, are they trustworthy? And then once you do that on your own without consuming, 
without, consu without consuming and not um, well understanding the verification process, then you might be, you might sort of protect yourself from fake news. Also not sharing information as soon as you receive. Because um, that's one thing that happened. That's why we get a lot of false information going, spreading as uh, fast as wildfire. Someone sends a message on WhatsApp, and the next thing another person is sharing. We do not know where the source is, who, who the source, who the who the well, the source of that information, um, and just so just basically looking through any message that you have received, and when you've done that. Um, putting them through a, a, a verification process before you share. So some of the things that we advise um, consumers of information to, uh, to, to do before um, spreading any kind of news that they receive. Um, yeah, so I'll just close that um, and then Great. try to share the a podcast that we have. Um, and then it actually talks about, it is on... Um, um, we treated, um, well, we treated the COVID pandemic and the question is the pandemic over in Africa is one of the, is the, is the, was the, was what we were looking at in that particular episode. Um, so I will put that here. Thank you. I think that will be very helpful. And I think, you know, there is also a podcast clip, which is, is what I think you're referring to. So I think this will be emailed to people and I, I strongly encourage people to maybe watch that podcast clip from SciDevNet. And uh, that would actually, you know, we were initially supposed to do that at the beginning, but I think, you know, in retrospect, we've had such a long and rich discussion. This may have delayed things a bit further, but you will be welcome to listen to this in your own time and we'll email that with the rest of the recording. And I think probably what I want to do is, you know, I was given the task of trying to summarize this, but of course, there's no time to summarize this. Now we've had such a rich and wide discussion ranging from, men, you know, from medical, scientific, emotional, environmental, and media and communications perspective is impossible to do that in a couple of seconds. But what I do want to just emphasize is that we've had some really interesting input from our, from our speakers. And I do appreciate their you know, dedication of time to this issue. And uh, each of them gave a very nuanced perspective from, as I said, the clinical, the mental health, from the media and communications and from the environmental and also from the commercial to a certain extent and social perspectives. And I do appreciate that input, but I just want to hand over very quickly now to Higher Education Media Services inside Net for any closing remarks that they want to make. And I'm not sure if that's gonna be Edwin or someone else, but I just wanna hand over to them. And just to note in closure that the recorded link will be mailed to all participants and will also be available online on YouTube. And as I said, and I'm emphasizing again, there was a podcast clip that was supposed to be played at the beginning and uh, there was no time and there is no time to maybe do that now, but this will be made available and that link will be given to people. So I strongly encourage people to listen to it. And I'll just hand over now to Higher Education Media Services at SciDevNet. Good day. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you for the last two hours. Been very illuminating, very enriching. I think there's not much to say except uh, on behalf of Higher Education Media Services, the Africa Science Focus Team at SciDevNet, uh, so support from Dr. Padiachi of the Technological Higher Education Network, South Africa. We'd like to thank you all, you know, our facilitator, Prof Singh, the panel members, participants. Do look out for the link and definitely the podcast to the SciDev podcast from the Africa Science Focus Team. Have a good weekend and we look forward to your feedback for the next time we do something similar. Thank you. Thanks everyone for your time and for attending and for being patient with us while we ran a few minutes overview. We appreciate it. And I see the link has just been posted here on, uh, on the chat for the podcast. And I strongly recommend, in fact, I'm busy clicking it right now, but I strongly recommend that people you know, uh, click on the link and you'll also get that link in your emails as well. So thank you very much for your time and your attention. And again, for the, to the speakers for their, um, you know, for their fantastic input. And thank you, Edwin, for issuing the invite to all of us to be involved in the session. And thanks for all the participants as well. Thank you very much.